Welcome to Open Source for Researchers, a podcast showcasing open source software built by and for researchers. My name is Abby. And I'm Arthur. And we're your hosts. Every other week, we interview an author published in the Journal of Open Source Software, or Josh. This is episode 10. We made it to the double digit. That's very exciting. Yeah. Today, we had a chat with Irea Mascara and Sean Cavanaugh about their paper, Shake and Break, Navigating the Defect Configurational Landscape. Irea is a PhD student at Imperial College London, and Sean just became an environmental fellow at Harvard University. So, second podcast about defects. Defects are important, though. We talked about this software that helps, I guess, pre sort of seed computational chemistry calculations. So it sort of sets up the configurations. Sounds like it's pretty important for helping actually truly explore the sort of properties of these materials. And then some nice tooling to help extract and manipulate the results that come out from the experimental runs. Sounds like a really nice piece of software. Also excellent, which I only fluffed. Once, I think. I only heard myself laugh at once. Shake and break. Shake and break. (laughs) Shake and break. Maybe I got it wrong a couple of times. I only heard myself say it wrong once. What about you? Did you find this one interesting? Yeah, no, I found it really interesting. And I think knowing that this group had like done research to find how general this problem of finding these low energy defects was, and then they created this potential solution with shake and break to help with that. So it was a nice pairing of releasing reusable open source software together with an actual research output. Yeah. A good origin story. Good backstory. Yeah. We talked about violence. We did. We talked about the process of earning a PhD and <laughs> how that can be scary. And some of us have scar tissue for that still. So are we going to do more defects after this or do you think we've had enough for now? Do you have any thoughts on that? I'll defects all the time. <laughs> I'm a defect podcast. 24-7. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thanks. This is how it happens. <laughs> I mean, if somebody's interested in sponsoring us to be a defects only podcast, I'd at least entertain that uh, idea. Seems unlikely at this stage, but. Who knows? <laughs> well, let's play the interview. Let's do it. Araya and Sean, really great to meet you. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I got tenure. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Um, I'm a PhD student at Imperial College in London. I'm in the group of Aaron Walsh. And we mainly work on modeling defects. So I'm an environmental fellow at Harvard now. So I've just finished my PhD, which was split between two research groups in London. So one in the same group as Zareya in Imperial College, and then also with Professor David Scanlon in UCL, also in London. And again, working on similar applications. So defects in energy materials is the main focus. Thanks. Well, congratulations on finishing the PhD. Big master. Yeah, thanks very much. Exactly. Yeah. Right, Four right years. passage. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like you mm-hmm. earned it? I don't know. Certainly in the UK, there's a viva and I feel like at the end of that, you feel like you earned it or I certainly did. Do you have that? Yeah, I think so. I think in some ways it's a bit anticlimactic is what people always say about like the, particularly the viva because I mean, for me, the main thing was submitting the thesis, which is like yeah. months ahead where you've actually done the work of writing because that's the worst part. I think then you're done with it. And then like the Viva and all that is just kind of formalities afterwards. So like the main celebration was like months ago rather than like just recently. But yeah. Wait, I'm, what, yeah, what is go. this word that? Oh, the Viva. Viva. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah. never heard of yeah. this. Yeah. I, this is also something I'm starting to learn now in Harvard here with, yeah, because the whole system is very nice. different here. It's, we call it the Viva, which is like the defense, the piece okay, of yeah, defense yeah. where you have to like go up and yeah. But then the system is so different because in the UK, it's usually behind closed doors. And so it's just like a couple of hours of questions with your examiners who have read your thesis before. Whereas here, I think it depends on the department, but here it seems to be that you present this big, long presentation to the public. And then there's a few questions from examiners and that's it. Whereas, yeah, so the whole kind of way it's done is a bit different as well. Thank you for that. Yeah. You generally know how serious your either is going to be by whether the external assessor has booked a return train ride home already. <laughs> yeah. Because if yeah. they haven't, then you might have problems because it could be like five yeah. hours or something. So there's all these exactly, horror yeah. stories. Two to three hours of intense questioning, often at a whiteboard. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's a rite of passage, I think. Yeah. Araya, That's will your survivor be like that at UCL? I guess it would be, right? Is that, as, oh, it's sorry, you, Imperial yeah. or UCL, I forgot. Imperial, yep. Yeah, yeah, similar, yeah. Anyway, I wouldn't mm-hmm. recommend it on my worst enemy to my worst enemy, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> anyway, back to defects. This is our second conversation about defects of late. I was wondering if you could give us just a quick recap on 
what they are, why they matter, what may be the particular interest that you both have in the subject area. And also, by the way, awesome software name, they can break. Uh, I'm always happy to see software with a pun name. So <laughs> most welcome here. I guess we're interested in defects because they control the properties of most functional materials. So whether this is for solar cells or batteries or thermoelectrics, the most clean energy applications that you can think of, defects are quite important. So yeah, that's why we were interested in modeling them and trying to predict how they affect the properties and maybe yeah, a material could be good for certain applications. Depends a lot on which defects are present there. Yeah, and we heard a great summary from yeah. Jimmy Shen in episode seven. So if anyone listening hasn't heard that, you can mm -hmm. jump back there and hear a little bit more about defects. He goes into the electrons. He went back to high school science for us. Nice. Yeah, building it up from first principles. <laughs> yeah, yes. That's right. And so, so is there a particular subset of materials that shake and break? focuses on that are a particular interest to your individual research interest? Yeah, we work on solid materials like crystals, kind of, yeah, crystalline, so we high order, so similar to salt, if you have sodium chloride kind of order, but it could also even work in materials a bit more disordered, but yeah, kind of generally it would be order crystal in the application. Mm -hmm. To add on to that, usually solids is like a quite a wide range of application so not just as we think for semiconductors and insulators but across the whole spectrum from low band gap semiconductors that we might use for solar cells up to yeah insulators that are used in like ceramic materials even like cladding materials and in nuclear reactors things like that yeah i guess it's a relatively general um application space from what i understand shake and break is specifically to help with these low energy structures can you explain a little bit more about that and like why you built shake and break yeah, it was a problem that has kind of been noticed um, in this field of research, but had been only kind of seen in a few select cases or maybe a little bit brushed under the rug. Um, but essentially, when we're modeling defects in these materials, of course, we need to know what the actual atomic structure or the geometry of the atoms around that defect site are to then actually be able to model it and predict its energy and other sort of behavior. But the standard way that we do that with our quantum mechanical modeling methods, so specifically DFT, it depends on what initial structure you give your model, because it'll take that initial structure and try to relax and find the lowest energy arrangements that it can starting from that initial position, that initial kind of path on this um, energy surface. But that could end up giving you what we call a local minimum on your potential energy surface rather than the global minimum. And so you can end up getting stuck in these kind of, what we call like high energy basins rather than dropping down to the lowest energy position on this potential energy surface. And so shape and break was a method that we tried to develop to try and counteract this behavior. It's essentially like a global optimization approach to try and ensure that we're actually identifying the lowest energy possible defect structure, which is the one we actually expect to occur in reality uh, in most cases. I actually really appreciate your hands visual. When I was reading, yeah. I didn't quite get that. Yeah, okay. yeah. I was going to say, you could use the board behind you if you want. I'd yeah. take a lecture on this right now. Yeah. Yeah. So DFT yeah. is density functional theory, I think, which is a yes. computational chemistry method. What is shake and bake? Shake and bake. Shake and break. That sign of a good pun when you accidentally use it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So not for the first time, I'm sure. Does shake and break actually drive the calculations or is that an implementation detail for the user, like what package they might use to actually run the computational chemistry calculations? What's the sort of broader stack of software that's, that's involved here? So um, shake and break is kind of a bit general. So it would just generate kind of the atomic arrangements or the geometries that Sean was talking about. And the user could decide what kind of software they want to use for the actual kind of quantum mechanical calculation, or even it doesn't have to be quantum mechanical, it could also be used in other methods. So yeah, that's up to the user. Like we provide compatibility with kind of the main or wider uh, softwares, like the ones that have a bigger user base, but yeah, kind of easy to use with another one. So this is more like a tool for helping set up uh, pre the sort of the precursor steps before the calculation. Yeah, so, like cool. Okay. Just to make sure I understand. So it's a tool to set up these calculations, but then it's also addressing a piece that's often overlooked in current de facto calculations. How does 
Am I understanding that correctly? So yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's as I right said, it's setting up these initial structures. So trying to generate a range of potential reasonable initial structures to start these defect calculations. So it's how it's I guess changing the approaches instead of just doing one defect calculation or like relaxation calculation that we'd call it in I said like the de facto or the standard approach. It's now that we're taking a range of possible defect structures that's output by shake and break doing the same type of calculation, but now with these range of possible structures and then shake and break also does this, the parsing and analysis side of it, where it takes the final structures and energies from those calculations and analyzes them essentially to see which one actually ended up being the lowest energy and then taking that forward for the rest of our calculations. So it gets like that sort of workflow, but not changing the specific quantum mechanical or otherwise like machine learning, potentially energy calculation. Makes sense. Okay, yeah, that was really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no so what what would people be using before Shake and Break? Like are there other uh, popular alternatives that you sort of found deficient in some way or you didn't like or, you know, is that other alternatives that people might use it? Yeah, there are a couple. There's one, I think it's called Climamed or something like that. It kind of addresses the same problem, like trying to find the most stable uh, geometry for a given defect. But it's quite extensive, like you would need a lot of calculations to find it. And it wasn't maybe as user-friendly as we wanted our tool to be. So that's what kind of pushed us to build this tool to make it kind of more efficient and applicable to kind of problems where you want to model a lot of defects in your material. When I was doing things related to computational chemistry, there were no open source tools for doing even the calculations. People would typically use tools like Gaussian or QChem. I'm curious if that's changed in the nearly 20 years since I completed my PhD. Are there, are there good open source tools for even doing these calculations these days once you've made those configurations with shake and break? So yeah, I feel like there are a few, like there are several kind of first principle code that you could use, kind of Quantum Espresso or CPTK in their open source. Yeah. FHIAMs as well, yeah. I guess is nice. Yeah. Is, so, is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Also some others that kind of the classical or machine learning kind of approaches. So I think there's quite a good variety and like people making great efforts for these codes to be open source and reduce the barrier for other researchers with less resources to perform these calculations. Nice. Yeah, that's great. That's great to hear. So this paper was actually nominated by one of the editors again, and okay. she was mentioning how, yeah, this group has done a great job of publishing software together with the work, which we really do appreciate. What encourages you to keep doing this when it's an often thankless job in academia? Yeah, that's a good question and something I guess we talk about or think about quite a bit. So as you mentioned first, the, the group, particularly David's group at UCL, try and, um, uh, and, and Aaron's group actually, I guess, with other software as well, like PyTaser, we'll try and yeah, make our codes open access and relatively user-friendly as well, so that people can actually easily pick it up and use it in their research. But yeah, what, what encourages to do when it's often a thankless job? That's a good question. I might actually think about that for a second. Yeah, I guess. I mean, part of it is like almost community service that you want your code to be usable and like to, to help push the forefront of research forward. If you actually want people to be adopting these kind of more advanced approaches to research, you know, the code itself needs to be usable because if someone sees some random code online that has like 10 different installation steps and involves you downloading and compiling something in Fortran and and a lot of this thing and whatever it's going to put people off at the same time you get some visibility and exposure out of it too so while it is in many ways a thankless job you still have your name attached to the code at least now with things like just you can actually publish the code and that count as a publication on your cv whereas before that you know often wasn't even possible itself so i guess that's what i'd say but no array at my house but there Opinions on yeah, I think I would just add we've benefited from great codes that were open source, so maybe like PyMagen or ASC that are kind of to manipulate okay. structures and that yeah. accelerates your work so much that you kind of want to contribute to that philosophy that I guess in science. Yeah, it's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah, the I, I like these answers are really heartwarming in some sense. I think your motivation sound really, really good. I, I was reminded of the I think mission statement of the Software Sustainability Institute, software.ac.uk, which is better mm -hmm. software, better research. I think, you know, Sean, what you're saying is you, sure you can share code that you use to conduct your one experiment, but actually 
much more valuable contribution is a more generalized tool that allows others to follow and yeah. do build on that work. Right. And there's so much opportunity yeah. for the open source story to actually have value in research and academia. It's actually a really strong yeah. fit, I think. Yeah, I really agree with that. I mean, I think it's really, I said, these tools like climate gen and ASC, where the same sort of philosophy of being quite readily usable and general as well. And then the fact that it's open source, you can see all the underlying code. And then if you want to tackle a specific problem in your code, a lot of time you can get inspiration by seeing how it's done there. Yeah. And then you can kind of go out implementing similar approaches. And yeah, the fact that it does, as you say, kind of give this large wide scale acceleration of research in the field um, as everyone can build on each other. Well, one thing that I find really interesting about this paper, if I understand correctly, it was your group that like discovered the issue with the low energy structures in the first place. So then being able to no, yes. Okay. But <laughs> I, I guess it was, yeah, it was kind of a big project on trying to see how general this behavior mm. was. So it was myself and Araya worked in this project where essentially it had just been from noticing this behavior in one or two select cases, both in my research and also in the literature. So there'd been this behavior had like bit okay. was noted before, but it, I'd just been in one or two select rare cases because essentially it's the sort of thing that you don't see unless you go looking for it. So it had only been noticed one or two times before, mostly like serendipitously. So by accident, it was kind of a semi-famous in the field, one for Joel Varley, who's someone who actually worked with Jimmy Shen at LNL, where it was from trying to do calculations of the migration of defects that then suddenly he found that on this migration path, actually there was a lower energy structure. So what he thought was the original defect structure actually wasn't. It was the transition state between the lower energy defect structures. So it was kind of mainly from, you know, occurrences like that people realize, oh, actually this can be an issue. And so, yeah, I guess we tried to do a more general study of, is this just a rare case and select materials or actually does this often happen in general across these different materials, which I guess is, yeah, what the study that myself and Araya worked on and we found is quite a general behavior and then tried to implement this method, shake and break to go alongside that with actually trying to tackle it in general. Yeah. And okay. So you discovered how general it was. Mm -hmm. You discovered how general it was and then yeah, okay. released shake and break just to help with that in the field, which I think is really admirable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where does news happen in your field? So like when somebody was like found that there was a lower energy state, was that a paper, a preprint where people were like, oh my God, look at this preprint. Or is there like a big flack or like Discord that everyone's on? Or was it Twitter or whatever? Like where, is that exciting? Or were people like, eh, yeah, whatever. Like with that big news, it seems like big news. I guess it depends, yeah, what the forum for it is. And again, it's like big news, but big news in the field, which can be at it's times still a big specific news. field. It's still a well. big so deal, right? Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, exactly. But I guess for that one, for me, it was like conferences are actually quite a big thing. But this, so like, yeah, the, yeah academic okay. conferences and then particularly ones that are kind of semi-focused. So there's obviously a lot of like big conferences where there's thousands of people, but some of this was actually at one of these, what are called um, Gordon research conferences. So a GRC, mm -hmm. a kind of relatively specific field. So in this case it was like a defects and semiconductors mm -hmm. conference. Um, we were at, so maybe like a hundred people there, hundred people across like where they work in this field. And, and so at some of them. It's quite nice that then it's all the talking points and the discussion. So both like actually in talks, but also like at lunch and at dinner, when you're sitting around the table with other people and talking about these ideas. Um, so I guess, yeah, for that specific one I mentioned was kind of, yeah, at, at, like a conference like that, where it was mostly talked about. So, all defects all the time. Yeah, like 24 exactly. seven for, for a week. 24 seven defects and some football at lunch, but mostly defects. <laughs> Probably yeah. talking about defects still, a little <laughs> yeah. bit on the side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. That's the point of research, right? You get super specialist in, well, it's not the point, but as a consequence of research, you end up quite narrow and what seemed like to feel like huge news. I still have a colleague who I worked in my PhD area. I studied this thing called the diffuse interstellar bands. They are some little things that you see in space. They're little spectroscopic absorption signatures and there's hundreds of them and none of them have been assigned in about 150 years. We don't know what they are. We don't know what the molecular carriers are. And yet, 20 years later, I occasionally email a friend of mine and say, do we have any assignments yet? And he's like, no, <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah. but it's going to be big news when they're awesome. You know, it's just one yeah. of the, it could, yeah. it could be, 
some interesting yeah. materials, presumably. <laughs> anyway, there you go. Don't study the diffuse interstellar bands, just in case anyone. <laughs> Not a good career. Let's see. Rina, I was good, wondering if you could sort of comment on the sort of state of peer review and software in, in your field. Like, did anything about the Joss experience... Did you think that was good? I'm not looking, fishing for compliments, I promise. But I was curious, like, if you found that a useful experience, is there anything, especially as it sounds like you both publish software, like, how do you feel like academia does generally in terms of sort of reviewing and understanding that work, that type of contribution? Do you have any thoughts on that? I thought JOS was great. Like, there's the fact that it's open and, yeah, that anyone can see it. Then that it was quite fast, at least for us, and that the reviewers were quite kind of involved, like looking at the source code, looking at the tutorials and going through them. So yeah, I don't know. I guess just was way better than the other experiences I had. Very good. Yeah. What about yourself, Sean? Do you have any thoughts on sort of publishing software more generally? Is that a thing you think is sort of understood in your respective field? Yeah. I mean, I think I'd echo what Dorea said first. Anyway, the, the Joss experience, I think in general is quite nice and involved in a couple of papers that have been published in Joss. And um, actually both myself and Dorea are on one paper that's currently under review in Joss as well. It's again, all Thanks. open source, but yeah, in general, I think people there give quite useful feedback on the software in some other publications that can be more just kind of some cursory feedback than like the paper that you've written to describe the software, but actually in Joss people make it a, a quite a good effort to actually download it, use it, you know, see, give feedback and actually the user experience as well, which I think is, can be quite important for these tools. And I think in general nice that there's now are these like avenues for publishing research software as well i think i think i mentioned that a bit earlier but before just there was one or two um journals like i guess computer physics communications but there wasn't so much of an easy avenue or obvious opportunity for researchers to publish software which makes it even more of a thankless job i guess because yeah if you spend months kind of developing this code that you want people to use and benefiting the community, but then there's nothing that really goes on your CV because of that, but then that can make it quite tough, obviously in, in academia, particularly to, to get a job. So yeah. it's nice that just kind of provides this avenue where you get a publication out of it and something that's citable when people are using your code and so you can show that, yeah, having some of those metrics as well. Oh, I'm glad it resonates. Sounds like it's, it was a great fit for you as a journal. So I'm glad that worked out. Yeah, I mean. yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. They submit another thing, so they must have been. <laughs> yeah, keep, keep them back. coming. Yeah. <laughs> I did want to ask a bit more about Shake and Break. So if people listening want to check it out, how can they get started? Can they start contributing? Um, are you looking for contributions? Yeah, I guess for use need, there are a few tutorials that they could follow. And then for contributing, yeah, like always happy to have more collaborators. I think the easiest would be just either to contact Sean or me or in the in GitHub, like uh, open an issue or something. But yeah, very happy to kind of have yeah. people um, contributing. Absolutely. And are you looking for any particular skills? Like how much quantum chemistry do they have to know to be able to jump in? They wouldn't necessarily need to. Like it would be more about, yeah, kind of Python and the general idea of, yeah, manipulating kind of atomic structures. But I guess that can kind of uh, learn easily. But yeah, I guess something that we were considering was kind of open to other methods. Like right now, shake and break is a bit more focused to quantum mechanical uh, calculations. So I guess if people wanted to use it with classical, maybe a uh, force field, that is kind of another method that you could use to calculate the energy. Like, yeah, it would be nice to kind of automatize kind of how shake and break parses the output from those codes. Awesome. Well, look, this has been really fun to talk to you about shake and break no shake and bake <laughs> i was curious if there are places where you would want people to follow your work online obviously there's this paper and this software but are there particular places that people can find your work that you would want to mention here oh i mean i guess we're both on twitter right if that's still yeah gonna stay the way it is who knows but With that let's yeah <laughs> yeah that's the future yeah. state yeah, academic Twitter, I think, is kind of in a yeah, confused state at the moment, whether it's going to stay Indeed. or go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, I guess it'll go on Twitter, right? I guess, yeah, you see it. A handy place for academics to follow each other and see what we're doing, both papers and other, yeah, things like code development. Yeah, I guess it's not one of the best ways to follow us, Soraya. Yeah, Google Scholar, I guess, is what people use as well in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess for Crow is also GitHub. We're also there. Yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can follow each other on GitHub. Fantastic. Yeah, and on Twitter, it's Araya ML for both Twitter and GitHub, actually. And yeah. then Sean, your 
Kavna underscore Sean underscore on Twitter. And then yeah. Kavna SE on GitHub. And we'll put I, those in the show notes. Yeah. Wait, you didn't spell out Kavna. It's look in the show notes. We'll have it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was for my like university username. So I just used that and then, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they always nice. cut yeah. off the last few di- letters of your last exactly. name. Yeah, and then... <laughs> my, my, yeah. My surname was a bit too long for them. So, yeah. So, K A V A N A S E. Yeah, that's the one. Someday I might understand how Microsoft's handles work. Have you ever heard that, Abby? It's very <laughs> weird. It's I, how they give you your email address. Yeah, I don't know. It's your yeah, last algorithm. name, and there's many characters as they need to use to make it unique. So I'm A Smith, but obviously there's an A Smith and there's also an AR Smith. So I get R, R Smith. Yeah. Anyway, we don't need to put that in mm-hmm. the podcast. That seems very boring. <laughs> anyway. Because I, I didn't have that problem. <laughs> I don't yeah, have Smith. It's A Kabuna because I don't have, <laughs> I don't ah, have your ah, Smith. How cool Everyone is that? Everyone has the last Shit, what are you going <laughs> Yeah, Everyone's Smith A, a Smith. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's true. Right. Anyway, all right, Sean, thank you so much for your time today. It's been really fun to meet you both and learn about your software. Thanks for being a part of Joss Test. Yeah, thank you no so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much for listening to Open Source for Researchers. We showcase open source software built by and for researchers. You can hear more by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. The Journal of Open Source Software is a community run journal relying on volunteer effort. If you'd like to support Joss, please consider making a small donation towards running costs at numfocus.org slash donate to Joss. That's N-U-M-F-O-C-U-S dot org slash donate dash to dash J-O-S-S. Open Source for Researchers is produced and hosted by Arvin Smith and me, Abby Kibunak Mays. Edited by Abby and music CC by Boxcat. Music